This is our last webinar of our reproductive um, genetics what is new webinar series and today we have um, the pleasure of receiving Dr. Carlos Simon but before starting his talk today I want to let you know that iGenomics team have been working with iGenomics Foundation in a symposium that will be taking place on September 3rd so please save the date in the next week you'll be receiving um, more information by email you'll be receiving our link for the page um, for descriptions of course it's uh, an inscription uh, for free as we have been doing with our webinar series and you're more than welcome to check our webinars um, you can make your enrollment only for one talk or for the whole symposium if you want. So in our next slide, uh, you see what we have, the program, um, the program that we are thinking or more than this, the program that we already received uh, the most of the acceptance of the speakers this is still preliminary, but we're gonna keep this one. Uh, we have a welcome presentation starting at 11 a.m. EDT time on September 3rd. And then we have a resume of all the talks that we had on COVID, but in that moment in September, we're not with guests anymore. What we want to bring on September, it's what already um, our clients and colleagues and friends are doing on their IVF centers. So to resume the IVF treatment post COVID-19, it's our first topic with Dr. Russo Folk, Laura Rienzi, Denis Sakas, discussing embryology, andrology, and the medical perspectives. And in a second um, block of, of talks, we have what is new in reproductive genetics, non-invasive, um, microbiome, um, and a, a whole discussion. And we'll be having a closing lecture with artificial embryos, uh, how to create human embryos out of the blue. If we have the pleasure to have Dr. Juan Carlos Espisua, will be the, um, the most enjoyable uh, talk for sure. So, without taking your time anymore, or any longer, I want to introduce Dr. Carlos Simon, that is no need to introduce you, I know that most of you know him already, but Dr. Carlos Simon is professor in the University of Valencia, it's senior lecturer in Harvard University, it's a clinical professor in Baylor College, and he is the head of scientific advisory board for iGenomics. Dr. Carlos today will be giving us the talk opening the black box, deciphering the molecular nature of endometrial receptivity. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlos, for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Juliana, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon to all of you here in Boston is uh, two, three minutes after 12. So what I would like is to, to address this topic that, as you know, we have been working on that for, well, probably 25 years or so. And the topic is, uh, the title is Endometrial Receptivity as an Actionable Function. Uh, first, um, I think that the, the best way to address conflict of interest is transparency. So, as usual, I would like to show here uh, what has been my relationships in the last uh, five years with uh, uh, pharma companies, with scientific organizations, with uh, publications, and being the most important that I am the founder and head of the Scientific Advisory Board of iGenomics that, as you know, is working on the topic that I'm going to present here today. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you have to know that. Um, the objectives, the learning objectives of my presentation, you can see it here. Basically, what I would like to do is to focus on the clinical problem that you all know, 
and uh, which is that IRT remains inefficient. And therefore, to have uh, to to just give the value to the clinical relevance of endometrial receptivity, which is what I'm going to discuss here today. Then I would like to to go with you for the understanding of the biological plausibility of this function, from anatomical medicine to molecular medicine, and ending up with the new technologies, which is single cell RNA seq, and what information is giving us to understand endometrial receptivity. Finally, I would like to, to show you how we have been trying to translate this basic knowledge to the clinic in, the, in an evidence-based medicine approach, uh, trying to show you what is the clinical efficiency of personalized embryo transfer, which is the strategy that uh, we just came across after implementing the objective diagnosis of endometrial receptivity using uh, ERA. So these are the learning objectives of my presentation. But first, let me start with uh, uh, the problem. And the problem uh, is just uh, the fact that uh, IRT remains inefficient. Of course, every clinic uh, will have different results, but taking all together, what is clear is that uh, 70 to 75 of IVA cycles worldwide, they are uh, unsuccessful. On, in other words, uh, life birth rates are between 25 to 30 percent per initiated cycle. And we know that the most fundamental reasons for us, uh, for, for the, the, that those IVF treatments are not successful, are basically because after transferring good qualities, good quality embryos, or even aploid embryos into the endometrial cavity, it doesn't lead to pregnancy. So this is the gap uh, that you can see in the slide. Uh, I think we have progress uh, in big deal in terms of oocytes, in terms of embryos, but again, this is just the gap here. Uh, there is a huge step when we transfer the embryos and when we obtain the results that we are aiming here, which is life birth. And this is just an example of, uh, of uh, the, the IVF results of the Netherlands, uh, because it's a country that uh, they are taking good care of the statistics. But of course, you know this, and this can be applied everywhere. So this is the, the, the problem. What is the, the issue for, um, um, for endometrial receptivity? The, the issue is that when we transfer the embryos to the uterine cavity, then the embryo should just oppose, adhere, and invade. And this is the black box. This is the, the situation in which we just throw the embryo here and wait to the pregnancy test that will come here. But this is the situation that we aim to understand more to be better off in our results for our patients. And uh, these are the segments of this implantation process. First, the embryo has to see what is in the endometrial cavity. And the endometrial microbiome is there and has a role. We are not going to discuss this today. Uh, then the embryo and the mother should communicate. And this is important for both partners at this moment. Then the embryo should adhere to the epithelial monolayer. And this is what endometrial receptivity is all about. This is the starting process then invasion is crucial. And this visualization is going to control the rest of the process. So all of this should be considered uh, together. Uh, what is the issue with endometrial receptivity? Well, the issue basically is the fact that we are aware clinically that there is a window of, of opportunity for us to transfer the embryos. And, uh, and this window was known for ma more than uh, 25 years, more than 30 years now, uh, which was this, this basic, this, this clinical work from Nabot, that at that time he was transferring day two, day three embryos in an ovum donation program. And he realizes that these three days, only when they transfer in a natural cycle embryos, in these three days, uh, he obtained decent uh, pregnancy rates. And the rest, there was no. Uh, pregnancy whatsoever. So from this moment, we were talking about a window, a window that we always uh, 
claim that is three to four days. And the issue is we think that this is for everybody. And as you will see from my presentation, as everything in medicine, this is not for everybody. It's a personalized situation. And of course, the, the length is not three, four days. And this is what I would like to, to show you and uh, to discuss with you further. But to understand this, let's start from the basics. And this is the basic of endometrial receptivity. The embryo should adhere to this monolayer of the epithelium, and this epithelium should change. This is what is called the plasma membrane transformation, and this is what it opens the window of implantation. And this is all about a menstrual cycle, to have a menstrual cycle in a menstruating species, in which is the endometrium which should prepare perfectly for the addition of the embryo. The embryo has a plan, has a time, and this is the endometrium that should be prepared at this moment for the embryo. If the endometrium is not ready, then the embryo will not implant. So this is what, uh, what, uh, what we, we can think as endometrial receptivity. The epithelial monolayer as the barrier for the embryo to enter inside of the endometrium. And we know that, that the receptivity means that there is a modification in the cytoskeleton of this epithelium and uh, there is a, a modification that allows for the first time that two organisms that are immunologically and genetically different, they adhere one to each other. And once it happens, then implantation will start. Now, what has been done to understand this process of endometrial receptivity? Well, everything started in the anatomical medicine. You are aware of the work of Noyes and colleagues was published in the first issue of Fertility and Sterility and create the basis for the first assay to understand how it looks like the endometrium in the uh, luteal phase in humans, based on these seven characteristics, histological characteristics. And this has been the most quoted papers in obstetrics and gynecology. But what you may don't know is that this was an invited paper for the first issue and uh, it was based on, on uh, slides for endometrial biopsies of just 13 patients. It was done here in the uh, Boston City Hospital, and uh, they just reviewed the chart of 40 patients, and only 13, they have the, body, the, the basal body temperature taken. That, of course, the majority of, of you, you don't know what it is, but this was the only way to, uh, to uh, think that the, this patient ovulates. And they take the temperature in the vagina every morning, and because of that, they were able. So, this work was based on these 13 endometrial biopsies. Can you imagine in our, in our days? So, I think that they have been doing a great job for the last 60 years, guiding us to really understand the phase and we just uh, date the endometrium according to them. But as time develops, we know that this system has a huge interobserver and cycle to cycle variation, and the endometrial dating is not related to fertility status. Therefore, uh, we have these randomized clinical trials that they were published in the early 2000s that uh, basically just uh, uh, make that histological dating step down as a valid method for the diagnosis of uh, luteal phase, uh, neither guidance through the clinical management in infertility. Therefore, at that time, in the 2000, uh, the molecular medicine and the transcriptome came to, to, to place. And there were some pioneers group, as the one from Linda Judis, the one from Peter uh, Rogers, uh, and, and ourselves, that we start at this time trying to understand the natural cycle from the molecular objective point of view with uh, what you may say today, like a Google glasses, trying to see what is the, the correlation between anatomy and exactly what is going on in terms of functionality. So we end up in the 2011, came in across with the uh, a transcriptomic signature of endometrial receptivity in order to have a system that can let us know in a personalized manner in a specific patient where is her window of implantation in order to just pinpoint the time of the transfer 
that it will not guide it only by indirect uh, levels of any hormones or just uh, whether it's seven millimeters or it's 8.5 millimeters. Uh, I'm referring to ultrasound just to create something objective. So, and this transcriptomic signature was based on the whole endometrial tissue. Uh, at that time, this was the technology that we have in place. A few years later, we start to work together with our colleagues at Stanford with the Steve Quake Group and the Zuckerberg Biohub. We start to work on uh, trying to uh, confirm this signature, but now at the single cell level. So uh, the results, you are going to see it very soon. The paper is coming in Nature Medicine. Uh, and what we did was to analyze 29 healthy ovum donors, the endometrium from 29 healthy ovum donors, in which the endometrium was obtained. We did single cell separation and we were able to do RNA-seq at a single cell level in 71,000 cells. So by doing this, we learned a big deal, which was in the first place, we learned that the human endometrium has six different and uh, noticeable uh, endometrial cell types. Four of them were stromal fibroblasts, macrophages, endothelium, and immune cells that they, we can clearly define using these Google glasses. Now at the single cell level, they can be clearly differentiated, but also the epithelium, both the ciliated and unciliated epithelium. So we are able to, of course, differentiate epithelium, but not only that, we identify also a, 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 a specific subgroup of ciliated epithelium. So this was uh, very reassuring because now the, 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 we have the capability to go for the identification of those cells by their single, by their own transcriptome. And we did this based on on this number of cells and this uh, specific percentage in each of the compartments. And what was very important is that, as you can see here in this image, in this upper panel, using this single cell approach, now we have been able to confirm the transcriptomic signature of endometrial receptivity. As you can see, there is an abrupt change in the epithelium, in the epithelial layer, Unlike what happens in the stroma, where decidualization is a more subtle process that is just growing after a mid, early mid-secretory phase. But here in the, in the epithelium, you can see that these changes are just abrupt. And this is what we identify now with uh, the diagnosis test of endometrial receptivity. So uh, you will see this paper very soon, but uh, what we learned from that is that uh, we have identified six major endometrial cell types uh, and four major phases. Uh, we, of course, define clearly the difference between luminal and glandular epithelium. Also, this abrupt transcriptomic opening of the window of implantation is present at the single cell level, and decidualization is started is initiated before the window of implantation is a, is a more subtle process. And we provide uh, evidence of the interplays between stromal fibroblasts and lymphocytes during decidualization in the natural menstrual cycle. Now, all of these basics we have been trying to translate to the clinic. And what we have learned from this and by performing the ERA test for now many years is that uh, indeed in the window of implantation, the majority of the patients, the window will be around five days after five days of progesterone uh, presence, either endogenous or exogenous progesterone. So this will be the place where more likely the window is. And also the length of the window is about 36 hours. But in 30% of patients, the window will go up to seven days of progesterone or even three or four days of progesterone. And some patients, the window will be even narrower than we expected. So from 36 hours, which is 
the majority of the windows, we have identified 12 hours window, mainly in those with uh, uterine, uh, malform uh, 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 uterine malformation, such as T uterus, such as uh, Arquatus, uh, such as uh, um, uh, double uterus, for instance, having a different window in each of the M uterus that we have seen. So uh, this is the, the situation. Uh, so even if this is a three-day window, the majority is one and a half, and, uh, and so that's personalized personalization is crucial to understand this. And because of that, we just uh, uh, put forward this concept, which is personalized embryo transfer, and we start as a treatment for the most difficult patients, for patients with recurrent implantation failure of endometrial origin. And the concept was, okay, in those patients that everything has been failed, and then we have been transferred either blastocysts after we used to do it in frozen embryo transfer or day three embryos following this line. Let's do the embryo transfer, not when the embryo only is ready, but also when the personalized window will be present. So do it in a personalized way and transfer the blastocysts either at day four of progesterone, six or seven or five, depending on what is the, the individual window of uh, the implantation of the patient. So in order to prove ourselves and to prove our colleagues whether this concept holds true or not, we have been working uh, um, in, a, in, in, the, in the concept of evidence-based medicine, growing our knowledge from case reports to retrospective studies to prospective studies and finalizes with a randomized clinical trial and uh, we have also two more clinical trials ongoing. Uh, the body of the publications, you can find it here. There are more than 20 publications going in this uh, pyramid of evidence-based medicine that they have put forward by our group with different collaborations, but also there are a, a number of independent retrospective studies confirming this finding as well that there are also independent retrospective studies that they do not find uh, an improvement uh, of personalized embryo transfer using the array. And uh, I think that the, 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 the tip of the pyramid, as you know, is the randomized clinical trial. And after many years doing this, and I will explain you, we have already, the, the paper has been uh, nowadays is, is pre-proof, is, uh, is accepted for publication. Also, the, the, the DOI is already there. You can access to that, but it will be soon published in, in, in paper. And I would like just to summarize what is the result of this uh, five-year multicenter randomized control trial uh, in using uh, personalized versus frozen or fresh transfer. Now, in the first appointment, now for every patient, just uh, just moving from the most difficult patient to every patient trying to see whether it will be worth it or not to use this concept in our day to day. So the research question was, is there in, a, any difference in the clinical performance of personalized embryo transfer guided by ERA versus frozen or fresh embryo transfer in infertile patients undergoing IVF. And uh, the study uh, was based on the, on the, on the point that uh, this is about IVF patients are their first appointment undergoing blastocyst transfer, either day five or day six. And uh, we just randomized patients for three arms of the study. The first is the personalized embryo transfer in which we have the embryos cryopreserved. Then, in the next uh, cycle, in the next, I mean, 10 days later, first month is to cryopreserve the embryos. When the patient has the menstruation, we prepare for the ERA test in 12 days. We obtain the results. And 10 days later, the embryos can be transferred in a personalized way. It is a strategy takes two months. Or uh, is randomized to frozen embryo transfer in which 
all embryos are cryopreserved, and then the transfer is done in the next cycle. It takes also two months, or just fresh embryo transfer, in which directly the embryos are uh, are grown during the in, the in the fresh cycle, and they are transferred back to the patient. Uh, the objectives were live birth and cumulative live birth after one year follow-up uh, in, uh, in personalized embryo transfer compared to the other groups. And the secondary objectives were implantation, pregnancy rate, biochemical pregnancies, ectopic, obstetrical outcome, and even we did a cost-effectiveness, uh, cost-effective study. This is the pedigree of the work in which uh, it was just uh, approved uh, it was starting in 2013, in July 2013. First, first patient, October. Uh, last patient, last live birth was in, in 2018. It took five years and the recruitment was four years. Uh, it was done in 16 sites worldwide. We expected, we recruited a total of 569 patients. And I'm going to show you the results of, of this. These were the inclusion criteria. Again, patients undergoing IVF at their first appointment, 36, seven years or less, because we want to rule out an uh, embryonic factor because an increase of an euploidy. So we want to do in a population where it's the endometrium, the main factor here. So it will not be biased by the embryo factor, normal BMI, normal ovarian reserve, the stimulation protocol was decided by each active site, and uh, they should have blastocyst transfer either day five or, or day six, according to the criteria of the lab in the different in the different uh, um, clinics. Uh, the exclusion criteria were now uh, take out implantation failures, recurring miscarriage, or any uh, pathology affecting the, the uterus. Uh, this was designed for the first, I mean, to go for every patient, not just the difficult patient. And post-randomization exclusion criteria were those in which progesterone level were higher than 1.5 nanograms at the day of ACG administration in all groups, just to, to avoid this. Uh, the absence of blastocyst that was that, uh, that we should remove the patient, risk of ovarian hyperstimulation in the fresh CT, and PGTA was not an inclusion, neither an exclusion criteria. This is a consort flow diagram in which uh, patients were assessed. 458 were randomized. This is the allocation that we have. And you have here the summary of the patient, how they proceed to the study, and how many we were lost during the recruitment, during the process. And uh, at the end of the day, we have from these randomized patients and these allocated, the, the, we have the ITT analysis of this number of patients in each arm. And uh, finally, due to non-protocol compliance for the reasons that you have here, either that uh, the embryos were transferred at the wrong time, or they have no embryos for transfer, or they were just, uh, were some mistakes during the protocol, uh, or some cases patients uh, terminate the pregnancy. I mean, for different reasons that you have perfectly specified in the paper, the per protocol analysis was done in this number of patients, in this number of patients uh, after uh, removing all of them that did not comply with the protocol. So this is the demographic and clinical characteristics of the patients at the baseline, in which, as you can see, there was no differences in all the, the, the factors that we analyze in any of the three arms of the study. Uh, these are the cycle characteristics and embryological data, again, by ITT in all the patients, uh, in which the only difference, uh, it was that uh, there were more embryos, more day five embryos transfer in the fresh embryo transfer group compared to uh, frozen and personalized embryo transfer. 82% uh, of the embryos, they were day five here, uh, but this was the only difference that we have at, at the ITT. Now, 
By intention to treat analysis, we did not see the only difference that we found between groups was an increased cumulative pregnancy rate in the personalized embryo transfer compared to the frozen and the fresh embryo transfer. And you have here the p-value and the, and the relative risk that we have. And uh, so again, you can see it here, the details. 93% in personalized between 79 and, uh, I mean, against versus 79 or 80% in the fresh embryo transfer group. This is cumulative pregnancy rate after one year follow-up. And uh, regarding the per protocol analysis, when we compare the three arms of the study, the difference that we found were in pregnancy rate, implantation rate, life birth rate, cumulative pregnancy rate, and cumulative life birth rate. These are the detail of the data that we have. Pregnancy rate, we have 72% pregnancy rate first attempt uh, in personalized embryo transfer versus 54 and 58% respectively in the other two groups. Implantation rate was 57% versus 43 and 38%. Life birth rate was uh, 14 points, 14 percent higher, 14 percentual points higher, 56 percent versus 42 and 45. Cumulative pregnancy rate was 95 percent versus 70 percent and 62 percent. And cumulative life birth rate was 71 versus 55 and 48 percent. The obstetrical delivery and neonatal outcomes per protocol were similar uh, among the three groups of the study. So there were no difference in any of the complications, uh, neither obstetrical outcome that uh, come after that. And uh, we, did, we either perform a cost effectiveness estimation per baby at home at the first attempt, and we compare the figures that you know are quite different in European Union and USA. And by doing this, what we learn is that uh, basically the most uh, expensive way of, uh, of, of, I mean, the, the, the most expensive way for the embryo transfer was the frozen embryo transfer, whereas the most economic was the fresh embryo transfer considering all the items that you can see in the paper that can have a baby by using these three different. So personalized embryo transfer, the cost was something was something in the middle between fresh, the most economic, or just frozen, the most uh, expensive way, so, somehow. So in conclusion, what the, the take-home message from this randomized clinical trial that, that came after all the bodies uh, of evidence that we have created in this evidence-based pyramid uh, is that uh, you, you have to know that the, the most important limitation of this study was the high dropout that we have because they were done in 16 active sites and we expected a 30% dropout and we just got a 20% more of patients that they did not comply with the, the protocol. So considering this, uh, what we learned is that per protocol analysis, we found that implantation rate was statistically significant in PET versus frozen, 14% higher, versus fresh, 18% higher. Pregnancy rate in personalized embryo transfer increased 18 points versus frozen and 14 versus fresh. And the uh, cumulative pregnancy rate in PET was 24.4 higher than frozen and 32 points higher than fresh. And uh, life birth in personalized embryo transfer increased 13 points uh, versus, versus frozen and 10.5 versus fresh. You have to know that we powered the study to detect 
a 15 percentual points increase in live births of personalized embryo transfer versus frozen. Uh, it was only achieved 13.8. That's the reason why it's not statistically significant. But, uh, well, still is this 13.8% higher in terms of live birth, and, but not significant. However, cumulative live birth in personalized embryo transfer increased 15 points versus frozen and 22 versus fresh, and this was significant. Another point that we learned is that there, is, there was a similar clinical outcome between fresh and frozen embryo transfer. So in our randomized clinical trial, we did not see any difference in clinical outcome uh, when, we, when they were fresh or they were frozen. And uh, there were no differences in terms of obstetrical delivery and neonatal outcomes among the three arms of the study. And cost effectiveness wise, uh, personalized embryo transfer range in the middle of uh, uh, fresh that was the most economic or frozen that was the most expensive uh, one. So uh, in conclusion, what I want to bring from, from this presentation, and I have repeated this several times, for sure you have seen that, is this, th this is IBF uh, 1.0, and this is what we are doing by not considering uh, anything as a, except to transfer the embryos in the uterine cavity with our actual knowledge. By adding the analysis of the embryo, nowadays we know that transferring aploid embryos uh, it increases 15% the possibilities of live birth. And uh, now adding the analysis of the endometrial factor according to this randomized clinical trial, you can see that we have 14% increase in this live birth. So we can range now from 30, 35%. We, will, we can move to 60, 65%, which is, I think, is the, the vision that we have in order to improve the quality of, 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 of our practice. And uh, we have two more RCTs uh, ongoing. One is an independent one from Shady Grove. That, uh, that is being done concerning the ERA. And another one that has been started in, is going to be started in China uh, with a completely different population. So th these are the, the data that we have unt until today, and this is the data that we are still uh, preparing uh, for the future to uh, reassure and to know at what extent we can get any help from this uh, diagnostic testing, from this genetic testing in reproductive medicine. And just finally, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this is the work for more than 20 years. And uh, in the last 10 years, we have tried to translate this knowledge to the clinical practice. And this is uh, thank you to the, to the work of a great team in which you have here the faces. Maria Ruiz has been from the beginning. Uh, trying to, to move this, uh, this idea forward. Um, also, uh, David Blesa in the part of the, the creation of the techniques. Uh, Diana Balbuena as a medical director, just uh, taking care together with Carlos Gomez uh, about all the randomized clinical trial and prospective studies that we are doing every day with different uh, clinics worldwide, trying to understand more the data and the collaboration with uh, Steve Quake in uh, um, Stanford University. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you for your attention and I hope that this was useful for your knowledge about the endometrial receptivity and I will be delighted to entertain any questions that you may have. Finally, I just want to acknowledge also that this is the work of, the, of our genomics team worldwide that is working uh, for the best to produce this translational work for all the colleagues that uh, they, they, they needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carlos, for your wonderful presentation and uh, coming over all the knowledge 
that uh, um, iGenomics and other groups have been uh, collecting regarding implantation, um, wind enough implantation. And I paying attention in the many questions that I received. So I think that you really have to be prepared because we have a lot of questions that it's good, means that everyone was listening to you. Um, and I will start uh, with some of them. So the first one is uh, how, uh, how, what is the percentage of patients that you need to change uh, the embryo transfer date uh, based on ERA results. So a question uh, regarding the um, displacement of window of implantation. Uh, full displacement, it's about 30%. In 30% of the patients, this is what we started with, uh, uh, with patients with recurrent implantation failure. In 30% of the patients that uh, we were, they have been transferred at day five, for instance, they should be transferred at day seven. So everything that we uh, indicate uh, displacement of more than one day, this is 30%. Now, also, nowadays, we are able, as you imagine, we have thousands of samples analyzed. Uh, the algorithm has been improved. So we can not only identify the displacement the, the, of the window, but also we can indicate where is the center of this window uh, because if uh, the results in the center when you transfer the embryo will be better than if you transfer the embryo in the borders of the window. So you will see that in some patients we suggest to move the transfer 12 hours earlier or 12 hours later, but uh, this is not what we call a displaced window. For that, we try to tune up the best moment for transfer, but in 30% of patients, definitely, we move more than 24 hours uh, regard with respect to previous transfer or even with uh, unknown situations. Okay. So another question here is talking about the RCT and uh, telling that uh, in the RCT, the patients included uh, undergoing to first IVF attempt. If you can comment a little bit regarding the recurrent implantation failures patient in your experience. Yeah, this was a um, exclusion criteria. In fact, this was, as, as you have seen in, the, in, the, um, in my slides, uh, the exclusion criteria were recurrent implantation failure, patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, and those patients with uterine abnormalities. In this study, we tried to prove the concept that uh, they, patients without previous failure, they may or not uh, uh, benefit from ERA. So we have only patients, uh, I think that about 5% or 10% of patients, they were having something like uh, one previous or at the most two but uh, not more than not three or more okay uh another question can you comment on life birth weights in the different groups the weight uh, of the life life birth weights in fact i can show you the data here uh, can you see the the can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so this is this is the, the weight that we have in the uh, different groups here. So birth weight in grams was three, uh, 3,100 to 800 to 900. So there was no difference in the birth, in the birth, birth weight. And when we just consider only birth weight in singletons, uh, there will almost the same 3.4, 3.3, 3.2. This is the, the, the birth weight in uh, twins. So uh, again, uh, we just uh, divided uh, this in, in these different uh, situations. And as you see, there was not real difference in birth weights in any of these three arms of the study. Okay. Um, in the RCT, you comment that PGTA was not an exclusion or inclusion criteria. 
what was the percentage of euploid embryo transfer in each arm? Yeah, this is an excellent question, and I can tell you that uh, uh, reviewers, they take care of this, and we have to, to give the full explanation, and we have to, to explain everything with in all detail. Percentage of total PGTA in this study were about 5%. Okay, this is, I don't have, but we're about 5% of the patients. And uh, these 5% were similarly uh, um, divided among the three arms of the study. So these 5% of patients with aploid embryos were equally distributed among the three arms of the study. I don't have the number of patients now in, in, my, in my head, but I can tell you this will be Five percent, and the, it was it did not suppose a bias. Uh, we have been uh, with the reviewers for for long time. We have four reviewers. We have uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we we understand that this is a, a change of practice. So uh, I think that the journal take good care to assure that they were the bias that the, they may be included uh, will will not be there. Uh, so. PGTA, one of the issues that they try to rule out as a possi possible bias for the results obtained. Um, do you have any similar design study running with PGTA plus ERA? Yes, we have two of them. Uh, one is an independent study, which is being done as we speak in Shady Grove uh, in the in the Washington area independently they are doing by, by themselves and the, the idea is to have uh, PGTA plus ERA versus just PGTA without ERA. So uh, they have the embryonic factor under control with PGTA and they randomize to have uh, ERA and personalized embryo transfer or not. This is one study and uh, we have also our own study doing the same. The only difference is that in the Shady Grove study, what they do is just to obtain, they do an endometrial biopsy for everybody. Those that they are having a personalized embryo transfer or not, but they do the, the endometrial biopsy in all the patients. So these are the two studies ongoing. Uh, we have a, an RCT in China that is only ERA. It will be a um, uh, repetition. It will be just a confirmation of this study, but now in China. Okay. So, can you comment ERA on natural cycle? Any ongoing trials? Uh, in natural cycle, you know, the problem that we have when we are discussing uh, hormonal regulation in the endometrium is that, as you know, the endometrium uh, depends very much on the hormones of the patient. This is something clear. Now, the fact that we do ERA and we analyze where is the window of receptivity in one analysis, it's very is related to the hormones that the patient has at this moment. That's why it's our strong suggestion to do the ERA always using HRT using just a simple estradiol uh, one i mean seven days of estradiol progesterone five days whatever estradiol or progesterone that you are using in your practice in 12 days you have the the biopsy and in in 10 days you have the results and you can move forward to the to the transfer this is consistent if you do this in a natural cycle you have to find out that the window, I mean, the ovulation will be at the time that you expect it, which you can solve that by adding ACG when you have your follicle ready, and this will take care of, well, okay, the, the ovulation is going to be there, add ACG and do the biopsy, ACG plus seven, which uh, it will be the time. So this will be basically the, the idea, but we rather prefer that you use HRT because it's completely consistent and you do not depend on the ovulation of the patient and most patients that you know as they get older ovulation is more confusing and you don't know whether 
this is really happening or not. And also you need to have a control in a natural cycle that requires a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work, uh, presence from the patient. And at this moment, I think this is the less that we want to have. So uh, it will be better to have in a, in a, in a more consistent way. And by the same, uh, by the, the same concept applies for the fact that using fresh embryo transfer. If you analyze the endometrium in a, during a stimulation protocol, you know that the stradiol and progest stradiol just is, is picking up. So the data that you may have, they will not be the same like uh, when you transfer your embryos later on, because you will do it probably in an HRT cycle or in a natural cycle. So all of this together makes to uh, really strong suggest to use HRT. We have done studies comparing the three protocols. In fact, we have one study published. And at the end of the day, when you have using natural or stimulated cycles, sometimes results are not the same as the HRT because hormones are different in those different cycles. Good. So more questions regarding the RCT. The first one, um, was any type of endometrial analysis done on the control group? Well, the, the, the control group were both fresh and frozen embryo transfer. Uh, we want to test personalized embryo transfer against the two uh, gold standard, which nowadays is still under discussion, although it looks like, uh, 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 well, as you saw in our study, clinical results were the same because obviously uh, they are more, uh, I mean, the, the, the way that you can handle a frozen embryo transfer is much more simple and you can optimize, you can planify that. Uh, but we were just having a personalized embryo transfer compared to these two groups. Uh, this is not one control, there are two control groups. And the study that we did was the error test in our group that we are just adding the error test. And in the other groups, the only thing that was done was what we usually do when we do the embryo transfer, which is the ultrasound, the hormonal levels, but uh, uh, we did not did histology or anything else, just for the concept that uh, we are just one, uh, one step forward than histology. We do not take histology for anything now in our molecular uh, analysis studies. And the reason I, I show you what are the reasons for that. Okay, so as I told you, it's a big list of questions. I think we have time for two more. Um, this one is really interesting. Um, did you study or, um, or took a look in the rate of miscarriage or biochemical pregnancy if it differs between the groups in your study? Yes, this is very interesting. This is a very interesting question. Let me show you. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Now, yes. Per protocol. Yeah, the, the clinical miscarriage, the clinical miscarriage, uh, it was very interesting that uh, uh, it shows here, as you can see, we have clinical miscarriage of 15% in the personalized embryo transfer, 14% uh 14 percent uh, in the frozen and uh, only five percent of fresh so because of that this was kind of uh, uh i mean this is an artifact because there is no such a thing as a recurrent miscar clinical miscarriage of five percent in fresh we know that all the the data are from 15 uh, even more so this was some confounding factor that we could not explain and that's why in the data you will see that we say that personalized embryo transfer produce higher miscarriage rate compared to frozen. But uh, we do believe that this is because, you know, these data, they, uh, they do not uh, reflect the reality that we see every day and we do not understand what happens, but this is what we have here. Uh, so in general terms, as you see, biochemical pregnancies were much lower 
in the personalized embryo transfer compared to the fresh. So somehow the message is that with, uh, with the personalized embryo transfer, uh, the factors that may affect biochemical pregnancies from the endometrium were, were less than in fresh. Uh, but uh, from the other part, since the embryonic factor was similar, the main difference here was this 15 versus the 5% that uh, we did not understand. But uh, this is what we have. In general terms, uh, the endometrium takes care of the biochemical pregnancies and the embryo, it's the responsible of the clinical miscarriages. This is just as a, as a broad, uh, intuitive uh, uh, metric. Okay, so it's 1 p.m. in our time already. I think I have the, the last question. Um, there is a recurrent question, so I think it's important to make it. Uh, for you to explain how ERA result can be the same in one cycle and the other. So how can we claim that ERA has the same result if we test the patient uh, some month in the future? Yeah, uh, briefly, I mean, we already published this six, seven years ago. We follow donors up to four years apart. And if you do the very same analysis at the very same moment with the same hormonal treatment, results in terms of defining the window of implantation will be the same. This transcriptomic signature uh, is with us all of our life. Uh, and this will be the same if you test any other function or any other organ. The only difference is that in the endometrium, the hormones matter. So if you take this in a different moment, uh, like an implantation failure, it's not like there is a specific disease that causes implantation failure of endometrial origin. It's the fact that you are taking this picture in the wrong moment, and that's why the embryo is not implanted. Further clinical data, we have, we have just uh, personally, I have done this with all my patients with era test that they got the first baby. We went to the second baby. I never analyzed uh, era anymore. Once the patient has the baby, I just repeat the embryo transfer two, three, four years ago. Later on, when they want to have the second baby within the same window and obtaining the same results. Thank you so much. So I think that it's timing to conclude because it's so three minutes past one. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Carlos, again. And if you want to uh, give us any final message. I just want to thank you. Thank you, Juliana. And thank you all of you for your, for your interest. And I think that now the endometrial factor is gaining the momentum. We know that this is uh, the place where we can just uh, get some improvements in what we have done. And uh, it's our, you know, it's our honor, it's our pleasure to, to be working on this for a long time. And now I think that uh, we can really improve things together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all of you, the ones that have been following us in the two webinar series were my pleasure to meet to you. I will be missing this contact every Thursday. Hope to see you participating on uh, GIF, that it's our symposium on September 3rd. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.